we need to have uh, a realization that we've got a, about 35 years worth of oil left in the whole world. We're going to run out of oil. When Mr. Nixon made his famous uh, speech on Operation Independence, we were importing about 35% of our oil. Now we've increased that amount 25%. We now import about 44% of our oil. We need to shift from oil to coal. We need to concentrate our research and development effort on uh, coal burning and extraction that's safe for miners, that also is clean burning. We need to shift very strongly toward solar energy and have strict conservation measures. And then as a last resort only, continue to use atomic power. I would certainly uh, not cut out atomic power altogether. We can't afford to give up that opportunity until later. I'm sometimes asked if I'm optimistic or pessimistic about energy. And I suppose, uh, to some degree, it depends on what terrible news I've heard on the news in the morning when I wake up. Dan at Harvard, and he's helped produce a book called Energy Future. There are some days when he doesn't think that future is very bright. How dependent we are, and really, that we do not have very much more time to get a handle on this problem. And I am pessimistic when I look at the last more than six years and see how little we have done as a country to respond sensibly in our own interest to this very great problem. Americans have grown up with a vision of unlimited resources, of endless abundance, and for much of that, our history, that has been the case. But in the last decade, we've run into a problem where we have constraints, where there are limits now, and it has hit us in the basic ingredient of industrial civilization, energy. In one 30-year period, this country's population grew by 54%. Motors, machines, engines, total horsepower, that went up by 750%. What really happened is uh, that our appetite for oil outran our ability to produce oil. We reached the peak of our oil production in 1970, 11.3 million barrels a day, and then we went down. We continued to have a very high and growing demand for oil, and the way we made it up was by importing more oil, and more oil, and more oil. The bubble of exponential growth. This is a concept developed and refined by energy expert M. King Hubbard. All right, we're already past the peak of oil production and gas production in the United States. We're importing almost half the oil we're using. We are 75% dependent upon oil and gas for our entire uh, economy, our entire industrial operation of the country. We're very, very vulnerable. We're very, very dependent. So therefore, it is urgent that we now get going on uh, a replacement. These things were accumulated over long periods of geologic past, and we take them out of the ground in a matter of, say, decades. Well, uh, there's no replacement. Uh, this is a one-shot affair. So that the, this uh, rise of our modern industrial society is a unique event in the totality of human history. But the new phase we're going into, which is uh, related to the exhaustion of these resources, is also a unique event in human history. We're moving into a phase that has never happened before in the totality of human history, and we're unprepared for it. We've all heard that fossil fuels won't last forever, but why? And if they are set to run out, how much is left, and when will that happen? To dig to the bottom of this one, we first need a quick refresher on how fossil fuels are created. And sadly, no, they're not mostly dead dinosaurs. You see, the vast majority of our fossil fuels come from the remains of plants and animals that lived around 300 to 400 million years ago. And we don't see the first dinosaurs until around about 230 million years ago. So, when these plants and animals died, that very, very long time ago, they were covered in layers of earth or silt. 
And because of the combined actions of three things, one, the compression from the weight of all that stuff, two, the microorganisms in there decomposing the content, and three, the heat underground, that transformed them into potential fuels. Coal is the remnant of ancient plants, whilst oil and natural gas mostly come from marine creatures. I, uh, I think I can smell shite. <laughs> plants, whilst oil and natural gas mostly come from marine creatures, with natural gas being made in deeper, hotter regions where the oil gets a little bit more cooked. Now we dig or drill this stuff out of the ground and because it has been accumulating for a long time, initially there was a lot. But because it takes so long to make, we're using it much, much faster than it can possibly be replaced. This means that there is effectively a fixed amount of fuel on Earth and we're using it up. So, yes, fossil fuels are going to run out. Smell shine. Well, you mentioned in one of your last talks that petroleum wasn't what we thought it was, that it wasn't <clears> a fossil fuel, that it didn't come from fossil animals. <laughs> yeah. Is it just a mineral? Is it a mineral like any other mineral? Is that is that how it is that how it uh, what would you say? Uh, how did it? What's the origin it, of? You of see, <clears throat> when they first found petroleum. Uh, because they were beginning to make motors and, and, and needed on axles of wheels on railroad trains and all that sort of thing. And remember, trains started in the beginning of the 19th century. Then oil went from a, just a lubricant to a fuel, and it made it valuable. And Rockefeller happened to be the smartest man in the business at the time, but he made a lot of most of his money, or much of it, off the transport of the petroleum as well as selling it. But <clears throat> One thing they realized was if you, because oil, uh, oil is, uh, putting a price on oil is like putting a price on a pail of water. You know, the, the, no, no initial cost is in the ground. And, and in those days, they were, some of it, almost what you'd call surface mining the oil. They didn't go down deep. So in order to get the price up, they hit on the idea that they would have to make it appear to be scarce. That, they, that boy, after we take the next few barrels out, we're probably going to have to close as well. You know, that kind of thing. Well, a very fortuitous event. In 1892, there was a convention in Geneva of, of scientists to determine what organic substances are. Well, the definition of organic is a substance with hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon. And so it's usually a living substance, a tree. You analyze a dead tree, hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen and grass and so on, living things, animals, we are, hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon. So at this Geneva Convention, Rockefeller took advantage of sending some scientists over who said, oil, petroleum, is hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon. Therefore, it must be derived from the, uh, the spoiling, the rotting, of formerly living matter and uh, playing the game properly when the this scientific convention was over they defined oil as a, a residue from formerly living matter well that makes it a fossil fuel I don't know why they decided to use the word fossil but it says you formerly living matter it's fossil well of course today and, and and another thing we should know is that there has never been a fossil of a, a, a real fossil found below 16,000 feet and you can't argue at 16,000 there's a level line because someplace the ground sinks and so on but 16 is what the scientists say 16,000 we mine oil or we, we drill for oil at 30,000 33,000 28,000 every day of the week so right there, we rule it out that it isn't fossil fuel. It's called fossil fuel for the minds of the public to feel that it is a, a, an asset that is running out, being depleted. We talk about depletion allowance, which is a lot of, you know. And actually, if you know the world's oil supply, you know that it is not going to run out for an awfully long time. It is the second most prevalent liquid on earth and, and we haven't begun to dig well with all that background you see the 
people in charge of the petroleum business for perfectly reasonable business uh, things, like any other man in a business, wants to keep his price as high as he can get away with. And the way to do is just say, well, there's no more. We, 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 the last barrel is going to cost $1,000, and then it's all done. And, and they preach that stuff. What bothers me is that, that in geology books, it's in there. The geologists say it's a fossil fuel. They, they've somehow they've been bought. I mean, you, I I went to a four-year federal staff energy seminar run by the government of the United States during the so-called energy crisis. I was the participant that represented the railroad industry. The airline industry was there. Every AA administrative assistant of senators and congressmen was there. The CIA was there, the Defense Department was there, the State Department was there. Sometimes sitting right in front of me in the row would be Henry Kissinger with his friend, um, uh, the, the head of the uh, Department of Defense. Uh, uh, that's too bad, I can't put the names with them. But anyway, people like that, top men in the government sitting there listening to the Federal Staff Energy Seminar. Well, what this was doing is for four years, they were teaching a propaganda line to the leading people in this country, and therefore to the leading people in the world, when you include the Hissinger, uh, Schlesinger, Kissinger and Schlesinger, among others. And the object of it was, as Kissinger used in his own terms when it was time for him to speak, to create a world price for oil. In other words, not uh, 30 cents a gallon here and 90 cents a gallon there, but let's get a world price. That's their goal, and they're trying to do that for wheat and everything else. We don't realize what, it, what the controls are, whether it's oil or some of these other things. Almost everything today is being categorized at the highest price they can possibly make it go. And so calling petroleum a fossil fuel is the basis for th this system uh, with respect to petroleum. and and. I went, I don't know if the name Arthur Kantrowitz rings any bell. Arthur Kantrowitz <clears throat> is the head of the Kantrowitz Labs set up by the uh, AFCO company uh, near Boston, uh, Scientific Laboratories, and um, a great man in the scientific world. And Kantrowitz and I were sitting at a table at this uh, seminar once, and the table happened to be all young college grad PhD geologist. And so just to get a conversation started, I turned to Kantowitz and I said, Arthur, what do you think about this foolishness of these speakers talking about fossil fuel? And uh, it was kind of put up. He started laughing. He said, you know, that gets me. He said, he says, I don't, he said, I don't have a geology degree, but he had a thousand other degrees. And he said, I don't understand. He said, you'd think that these heads, these other fellows at the table, we did it on purpose, start <laughs> listening, you know. And he asked, he said, uh, are you gentlemen, he says, you're here at the meeting, are you gentlemen by any chance geologists? And one fellow, yes, I am. And the other, yeah. he said, well, why don't you tell me? He said, why, why is, why is, oh, you know, he went on like that. We brought the house down because nobody could argue with Cantrowitz. He like, he like Einstein, people aren't going to, and he told him right there, he said, just drop it. But it's, it's in all the books and in all the papers. But it started from that strange meeting in 1892 a scientific convention. In G I have a big, thick scientific encyclopedia put out by the Devon Ostern Company that's about oh, 15 years old now, but it has the whole story of the conference. It doesn't have the Rockefeller part, but it has the whole story of how they straightened out organic chemicals and how it was all figured, and they've got petroleum right in there. Amazing. Amazing. So <laughs> These aren't accidental things, you see. There's a dollar sign behind almost everything. Mr. Van Hulst, how much longer do we have in terms of fossil fuel? How much longer? 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years? When are we out of coal, oil, gas? Never? Tell us. None of us sitting here will ever see that day. It's my prediction. Really, I think this is, you know, this is a, a myth that you know, we don't have enough fossil fuels. We will have fossil fuels. The reserves now in oil and gas today are as large as they were 20 years ago or 30 years ago, despite the huge consumption that we had but until I, now. 
a, a colleague of mine wrote a best-selling book and says, you know, we got peak oil shortly. We're out of oil. It's going to be a disaster. Yes, but really, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, this is a, a, a myth uh, which uh, has been going around a lot. By the way, you, you hear a lot less about it last year. So I don't so have to buy a Toyota Prius then? There's no I point. don't know. I mean, one of the main reasons is, if I uh, try to explain it very, very, very quickly, is that you know, it is, not, it is not like a glass of water where you say, I drink my glass of water and if I finish it, you know, the oil is finished. It is not like that. If I tell you the recovery rate, the average recovery rate at the global level of oil today is 35%. Now, it's a technical term, I apologize, but it means 65% of the oil which is in the ground stays there. Now, why does it stay there? It stays there because we do not have the technology yet to get it out, or it is too costly to get it out. Now, if I increase my recovery rate to 36%, one, one, I have two years more of global oil consumption and only increasing it with 1%. So, obviously, the technology will develop, and we are now getting oil out of the ground, very deep sea, at levels which 10, 15 years ago would be thought completely unthinkable. So this technology will progress. And if oil would become more scarce, which it probably will, and the price will go up again, then the incentive, the economic incentive also, to recover more oil will be also going up. So again, you will not see the end of oil, nor will your children. But I mean, without being facetious and without trying to be funny, seriously though, I, I, I blocked out 20 minutes for our discussion about the energy crisis. Shall we skip to the next chapter? Yes. This it's is not serious. the issue. Yes. But where do, all, it these, is, it where do is. all these stories about energy shortage, about fossil fuels running out, where do they come from? Well, I mean, there are a lot of people which are what I call techno-pessimists. You know, they think, yes, it is true that we have this make this technologi technological advances, but we sort of are at a plateau at the end of it. But this is not how, I think, innovation, we heard a very nice intermezzo also about innovation. Obviously, there is a lot of innovation going on. And I tell you, in, in, in fields in Saudi Arabia, again, I, I make this comparison with the global recovery rate of 35%. In major fields in Saudi Arabia, they're moving towards 50% recovery rate. In the Norwegian continental shelf, companies are recovering up to 60% now. So if you would move probably in 15, 20 years to that kind of level of recovery rates, obviously we will have enough oil. Really, the issue is much more the investment because it takes a lot of investment to get it out of the ground and get it timely into the markets. Issue of deliverability of oil and gas is a much larger issue than the issue of availability. And how about, okay, so assume we have enough oil, depending of course on the price when it becomes... Maybe as, just as a footnote, I mean, we, had, we have had two large ministerial meetings this year, in 2008, where consuming countries, producing countries, over 60 ministers, over 30 CEOs from big companies, oil companies, were all together. And this was one of the, of the outcomes. I call it the new energy consensus. Was there anybody from Holland there? Any, anybody? Of course. Who, the, who was the there? Dutch minister, the Dutch Minister of Economic Affairs, Maria van der Hoeve, was so there. So why didn't she tell us that? Jeroen van der Veer was there. CEO from Shell was there. She, Jeroen van der Veer um, has adverts in the newspaper, and I'll get to the other gentleman in a second, and magazines every day saying we're looking for new energy alternatives. Of course, but that's what I'm, what I'm saying. No, I'm John Stossel, and welcome to 2020's webcast. Here's a warning I bet you've heard over and over. The world is running out of oil. Maybe it helps explain pump prices cruising past three bucks, or does it? Or maybe it's just another media myth. Is there more oil out there than all those chicken littles say? There's a vast supply of oil just 500 miles north in Canada. The tar sands of Alberta alone contain enough hydrocarbon to fuel the entire planet for over 100 years. What's he talking about? 
This is what the Canadian tar sands looks like. It's a Florida-sized patch of this disgusting stuff. Sand and rock mixed with oil. Lots of it. We're talking trillions of barrels. The whole planet from Alberta for about a century. Peter Huber, co-author of The Bottomless Well, says people think we're running out of oil because we're running out of cheap oil, the kind that's found in the Middle East, already liquid, clean, and ready to refine. It's very cheap to get that oil out of the ground, so of course that's where people go first. They can pull it out of the ground for five bucks a barrel, less. It costs three times as much to get oil out of these tar sands because they have to add hot water to the sand to separate the oil. But now that oil's expensive and likely to stay that way, companies find it profitable to do this. Clive Mather, who runs Shell in Canada, says the Earth's supply of hydrocarbons is almost infinite. And those are not running out. In fact, we've ha hardly started to develop them. The planet contains huge amounts of buried hydrocarbons. The question is, can you get them out? At what price? But so why are we hearing all this stuff about running out? It's nothing new. People have been saying this for 150 years. They sure have. So-called experts say things like, we're going to become a dying civilization. We will see the extinction of Homo sapiens. People are always saying that about it can be Ebola, it can be flu, global warming. Sometimes uh, they're right, usually they're wrong, and they've been saying it about oil for a long time. They sure have. And joining us now from Washington is Peter Huber, co-author of The Bottomless Well, The Twilight of Fuel, The Virtue of Waste, and Why We Will Never Run Out of Oil. So, Peter, with that title, how, how come we keep having oil when all the experts say it's going to be gone by now? Well, the planet is bigger than uh, a lot of people uh, believe, I guess. Um, yeah, you know, we, we're accustomed to these pictures from outer space and this tiny little jewel of a planet. It looks like a teardrop out there. But it's a very big planet, and we've barely begun to scratch the surface. But it is a finite resource. Sure, sure. And the fun is a, a, a finite resource as well. You know, the solar system is a finite resource, but we're not about to collide with the limits. So, you know, if, you're, if we're quibbling about definitional things, finite versus infinite, sure, it's finite. The sun is finite, too. Are we worried about running out of solar energy anytime soon? No, but you talk about Alberta, Canada maybe providing enough energy for the next hundred years. Then what? Look, a hundred years from now, the, the one thing I'm sure of is that things will be very different from uh, how they are today. The, the planet has a lot beyond uh, buried hydrocarbons. Uh, we, we have huge amounts of nuclear fuel. There are uh, gigantic, huge amounts of frozen uh, gases. Uh, the, the hydrates are uh, just off the coast of most continents. I mean, uh, enormous supplies. Ask me a thousand years, I'm even less sure of what the technology will be doing, but I, I, I'm quite sure it won't, we won't be driving uh, sort of uh, 19 or 2006 SUVs a uh, hundred years from now or a thousand. So in terms of oil, the issue is really just price. And at these high prices, it's profitable to suck it out of all kinds of new places. Well, it's price, it's technology, it's, uh, there are environmental concerns, there are political concerns. Uh, Saudi Arabia can pump oil today for well under $5 a, a, a barrel. That's about a, a dime a, a gallon, uh, what they're just pumping crude out. Um, is that the only cost involved? No, of course not. You have to have refineries. If a hurricane sweeps through our, our, our refinery area on the, on the Gulf Coast, that, that's an issue. Uh, if war breaks out in the Mideast, that's an issue. If somebody begins tossing nukes around the Mideast, that'll be a very big issue. Forget $100 oil. We could see $500 oil if things get bad enough. But, but is the planet going to put a stop to this? No, not, not, and not in our lifetimes, not in our grandchildren's lifetimes. So, I briefly uh, uh, thought that this might offer an explanation that the physical reservoirs of oil, the known giant fields and so forth, were actually beginning to decline their production rates. Then the more I investigated, I went to conferences where uh, prominent spokesmen for the peak oil theory uh, uh, were present uh, and giving their arguments, and what I uh, found was that all of their arguments were based on oil being a fossil fuel. And then some scientists, friends of mine, uh, uh, sent me certain scientific papers that had been generated out of uh, Russian scientific circles during the Cold War. And they presented an entirely different theory of the origins, the, the genesis of hydrocarbons, not just oil, 
hydrocarbons include oil, gas, coal, tar sands, uh, 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 shale gas, shale oil, and so forth. So it's it's a quite uh, large spectrum. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about the scientific work that was done first in the Soviet Union and then in Russia? Mm -hmm. I'm in touch with some of the leading uh, scientists, uh, Russian scientists, uh, who have been involved in this uh, work for decades. It largely is unknown in the West for two reasons. One, during the Cold War, there is, of course, top uh, classified security uh, blanket put on any of this research because it was done uh, in institutes of the Academy of Science, uh, geological institutes, and so that were also doing research in deep earth underground nuclear explosions. So all of this uh, was shrouded in Cold War secrecy. Uh, the Russians were given the order back in the 1950s to come up with a solution to make Russia or the Soviet Union uh, energy independent from the West because uh, Stalin at that time saw that this was going to be a, a very challenging thing to uh, maintain uh, Soviet independence in the, in the face of the uh, creation of NATO and, and so forth after 1948. So they looked at the origins of petroleum in a rigorous scientific way and they looked at the literature in uh, Western geological textbooks and so forth and they found nowhere scientific, uh, rigorous scientific proof of the genesis of hydrocarbons, the genesis of oil and gas. Uh, it was postulated as simply a gospel truth, like the uh, virgin birth perhaps, uh, a gospel truth in American universities and British universities and then by extension uh, throughout the Western world, that oil was a fossil fuel that somehow originated from dead dinosaur detritus that somehow in some cases magically managed to find its way uh, 20 kilometers under the surface of the earth to create uh, pools of, of hydrocarbons. Uh, the more the Russians looked at that, the more they said this is patently absurd. This theory of fossil or biological origins of, of uh, so much petroleum, so much, and uh, the fossil crowd uh, also claims uh, coal because it's also a hydrocarbon. It's another form of, of hydrocarbon. One author that is known here in the West um, as a writer about abiotic oil is Thomas Gold. Mm. However, you have you have to criticize him. Well, the problem with with Thomas Gold, he's passed away now. He was not a deep earth geophysicist. He was a astrophysicist who perhaps uh, knew uh, an awesome amount about the the heavens and the stars and the planets, but he didn't understand basic uh, geophysics. And he was fluent in Russia, he was an ambitious man, and he came across a few of the Russian language scientific papers of the abiotic Russian scientists or their scientific group and drew on them, uh, the Russians accused him later of plagiarizing their work, drew on them and put them together with some of his theories that uh, uh, impact craters from meteorites uh, such as in Sweden or the Caribbean uh, create the conditions for, for uh, abiotic oil. And uh, he wrote a book called The Deep Hot Biosphere. And he tested his theory with an exploration in a uh, meteor uh, crater in Silian in, in Sweden. And it was a complete utter failure. The, the, the amounts of gas that, that uh, were discovered there were, were wrong. Later, the Russians went back with a contract from the state Swedish government uh, and realized that every place Thomas Gold's uh, team drilled was exactly where not to drill. He didn't understand the, uh, the notion of migration channels, of, of uh, uh, tectonic blocks and, and so forth, uh, the way the Russians had developed it over a course of 50 years now. So uh, gold is often used to discredit the Russian scientific advance because number one, the largest oil companies in the world, the last thing they want to hear is that uh, China and other countries could find oil in places they never thought before to look because the fossil theory says there is no uh, source rock there, there's no sedimentary basin that's going to hold oil, uh, so therefore don't bother looking. 
Do the Russians, for example, in Siberia find oil where they shouldn't find oil? Well, the irony is, during the Cold War, and I have this from the Russians themselves, during the Cold War, uh, the Soviet bureaucracy at the highest levels feared for their job. And they didn't dare trust a new theory, which this was. This was a revolution in, in uh, uh, geophysical thinking. The idea that oil is generated. Let me say a word about uh, the, the uh, uh, genesis of oil that they discovered. Oil is generated deep in the core of the earth. It's a gigantic oven, if you want to imagine it. And through the enormous temperature and pressure, it's forced up through the granite mantle, which is the next layer going upward from the core out like a giant golf ball. Uh, it goes through fissures or small cracks in the mantle and because of the force of energy it tends to go in a straight line as uh, efficiently as possible toward the surface of the earth until it meets a uh, uh, trap rock or a uh, reservoir where it, it's uh, on upward uh, journey is, is hindered and there it accumulates as, as reservoirs of oil or gas. Um, the interesting thing that the Russians discovered is every giant oil field in the world, every giant oil field without exception is a self-replenishing field because this oven, the core of the earth, is always on. You don't turn it off. It's always on. The earth is, imagine it as a giant balloon with layers of paint crust on top, well, the balloon is expanding by millimeters per year, and that's why you have things like earthquakes in Haiti or in Turkey or in Iran. Uh, you have uh, tsunamis uh, that affect Japan and so forth, because the entire Pacific is this so-called ring of fire of volcanoes. That's an enormously tectonically active uh, part of our planet. So uh, the oil is being constantly generated, the gas is being constantly generated. We're not running out of oil, ironically, we're running into oil any place uh, basically that we look for it. Offshore Brazil, the Mediterranean now is one of the hottest uh, natural gas uh, plays in the entire world and it's changing the geopolitics of the Middle East. Yeah. Can you tell um, our viewers some names of Russian scientists so that they are able to take a look at those uh, scientific uh, work? Well, a lot of their papers have been uh, printed by peer-reviewed scientific journals uh, uh, in the States and, and elsewhere. Uh, if people go to my book, Myths, Lies and Oil Wars, I have a detailed bibliography of the most serious scientific papers, uh, I think 10 or 15 uh, papers, and that will give ample uh, evidence that, and the, the experiments have been repeated in the laboratory under pressure and temperature conditions which never has been done with so-called fossil fuel. You've never taken a dead dinosaur or a dead anything or a dead plant algae and transformed it under temperature and pressure into a hydrocarbon that hasn't been done because it can't be done. So uh, the experiments, even the Carnegie Institution in Washington has conducted an experiment and the Russians were invited in to consult on that because Carnegie didn't know quite what they were doing. So uh, this is established. This is no theory anymore. This is established. The trick of the thing, and this I know from long discussions with the, the Russian scientists involved, the trick of the thing is to know where those uh, migration channels lie. For example, the, the explosion, the, the sinking of the entire huge platform of, of, uh, in the Gulf of uh, Mexico, in the Caribbean, several years ago from BP, uh, took place because unknowingly, in their greed to drill alone without a partner and uh, discover uh, uh, another huge oil find, because they discovered one seven miles away a, a couple of years before, they, without knowing it, tapped into one of these migration channels. And the force of that explosion, because they hit you know, the source of this tremendous uh, pressure coming from deep within uh, literally blew this platform out of, out of the uh, universe. Yeah. Uh, in the meantime, now there's this fracking hype, let's call it this way, in the US. Mm. What are your th uh, thoughts on this? Is, is this the new renaissance of the US as a superpower in energy? Uh, shortly answered, no. The 
fracking to, to inject millions of gallons of, of uh, water with, with chemicals added to it uh, into shale rock formations uh, and then blasting the, uh, the gas that's trapped in the, in, in the interstices of the shale out and capturing it, uh, number one, it's a horrendous user of energy to, to get that in the first place and number two, it's a horrendous user of water. Number three, if depending on the depth you're drilling at, uh, and they do this through new techniques of horizontal drilling where you can make a right angle turn under the earth, uh, you have to admire the sophistication of, of the uh, mechanical side of this, but uh, leaving that aside, the, what they find is that the rate of depletion of these uh, trapped gases in the shale is so rapid much more rapid than conventional gas, that uh, the formations run dry within a matter of two to three years and you have no gas anymore, but you've had to drill so many wells to keep the pressure up and keep extracting gas that it's a, it's a financial nightmare. They, the Wall Street uh, investment banks were huge behind this uh, fracking uh, bubble, I call it, the fracking bubble initially, because that provided another way for Wall Street to get huge uh, profit returns when the economy was otherwise dead in the water uh, in the last five, six years. But the, uh, so they've moved now, now because these uh, oil companies uh, 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 like Chesapeake and others were under such pressure to uh, produce the gas and get it on the market to, to uh, pay down their, their leveraged loans from Wall Street. Uh, they collapsed the price of natural gas. So the same companies migrated over and began looking for oil trapped in the shale, called shale oil. And uh, that's where the concentration is at the present. Indications are from well data, production data, that the shale oil, as with shale gas, uh, depletes also very rapidly because it's, it's trapped in a very specific rock formation. Uh, I think there are much more efficient ways uh, to find oil and gas. Ironically, the shale oil and gas boom in America has uh, gravely disproven the peak oil uh, argument, and you hear uh, relatively little about that anymore, except there's, there's always a lag effect in scientific knowledge. So the German government and various EU institutions uh, still haven't caught up with the latest developments, and they finally have accepted the idea that there's a a peak oil, an absolute peak oil, and the resource is declining at a time when the opposite is, is being demonstrated by reality. This is Talk of the Nation Science Friday. I'm Ira Plato. Later in the hour, we'll be talking about an unconventional view about where oil comes from, and then we'll move on to the Voyager spacecraft anniversary. You're listening to Talk of the Nation Science Friday. I'm Ira Plato, and we're going to be switching gears right now and talk about common knowledge. You know, you were... What were you taught in school about how natural gas, coal, and oil were formed millions of years ago deep within the Earth? Well, chances are, if you're like me and the rest of us, you were taught that these fossil fuels come from the remains of decomposed organic material from prehistoric plants, animals, swamps. You know, you remember the picture of the dioramas from the museums? Well, a paper published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences this week presents a way that these reactions can take place. The authors manage to make hydrocarbons under heat and pressure, but not using organic material, not with plants and stuff like that, but using solid iron oxide, marble, and pure water. Joining us to talk about this work is J.F. Kenny, CEO of the Gas Resources Corporation in Houston, Texas. Welcome to the program. I do. Yeah, well, walk us through this a bit. Now, the, the one theory that we all are taught that the, that says the petroleum is formed from the decomposed remains of ancient organic life, and your theory discussed in your paper recently publishes that you published says what? How is oil formed? Okay. First, dear sir, I, I must correct you on two points here. First, the notion that petroleum originates in from some transformation of biological material mm -hmm. in the shallow sediments of the earth is not a theory as such it certainly shouldn't be called that it was only enunciated as a hypothesis but it was enunciated in the year 1757 by the greatest Russian 
scientist of the 18th century, Mikhailo Lomonosov. That's the biological hypothesis. Certainly Lomonosov never intended it to be more than a hypothesis. That's 18th century Russian petroleum science. What you have received a small taste of in my article in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences is a small taste of 20th century Russian petroleum science. The author certainly I emphasize are... this because your phrase, my theory, is terribly <laughs> incorrect. Right. Well, your name's on the paper, so I, I, yeah. I mistakenly, well, uh, I don't think mistakenly, uh, you, you do quote, uh, and your colleague's certainly a Russian, Russian scientist yes. through the paper, but your name's on the paper, too. Yes, but you should understand, in fact, the modern Russian petroleum science was first enunciated in the year 1951. And to take a half step back, you should understand that in 1946, the then Soviet government was confronted with two uncomfortable facts. The first was that to, make, to wage a modern war requires enormous amounts of petroleum. That was point one. Point two, Russia was a petroleum-poor nation. At that time, they had only what they believed to be the depleting fields in the Ashkelon Peninsula near what is now Baku, in what's now the modern independent nation of Azerbaijan, and the newly discovered fields in Turkmenia and Tatarstan, which turned out to be enormous fields, but they didn't know it at the time. The Soviet government initiated a Manhattan-type crash program to learn about petroleum. Where is it? What does it come from? How do you find it? And so on. Mm -hmm. And out of this program came the enunciation by the great Russian geologist Nikolai Kudryadzev, the modern Russian, what's now called the modern Russian Ukrainian theory of deep abiotic petroleum origins. That's what you've read a taste of. Well, in this well, let me, get, let me give my listeners a taste of the article. And the article says that basically um, these scientists were able in a laboratory yes. to take uh, basically rust, right? Iron oxide. Okay. okay. Two, uh, rust, nothing marble. Exactly what's a, nothing but iron oxide, which of course is a solid. Right. Marble. That's like you, you got it right, calcium carbonate, mm -hmm. wet with triple distilled water. They brought it up to the enormous pressures that you find in the mantle of the earth. That I say is a bit of back, and then out came oil. You could take it and put it in your gas tank and drive home with it. And that's all there was in there. No, there was uh, great care was taken to make sure there was no contamination and no. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. No, no, no. Well, yeah, that's, that's enough. Uh, um, yet yet uh, this uh, this theory is certainly not widely accepted by everybody. They say uh, that... No, excuse me, sir. May I correct you right there? Go ahead. On two points. The fact that oil does not come from squashed fish or putrefied <laughs> cabbage has been known by competent physicists and chemists and chemical engineers, mechanical engineers ever since the last quarter of the 19th century. Why, why is that? Why do they know this? Oh, and Because the second law of thermodynamics prohibits it. Oxygen and hydrogen combine spontaneously to form water. Water does not spontaneously dissociate itself to form free oxygen and hydrogen. That represents an irreversible physical phenomenon. Mm -hmm. The laws of which describe that irreversibility is a law particularly called the second law of thermodynamics. Now, unfortunately, in Britain and America, and I emphasize, when I say Britain, I mean Canada and Austria and all those places. In Britain and America, there is this bizarre fetish among geologists that they don't study physics and chemistry. And you can ask that of any any man who sat through the basic courses in physics and chemistry at any university. Next time you hear some geology professor from America or Britain spouting off his mouth about oil coming from dead whatever, you ask him two questions. They're both significant to this point. The first question is, tell me, professor, describe the university-level courses in physics which you took while you were studying. That's the first question. The second one is, tell me, Professor, 
how much oil and gas have you discovered lately? Mm -hmm. Rather cynical now. What isn't in that article, which I wrote, was any description of the enormous quantities of oil and gas found by these men practicing the modern theory of petroleum, the Russians and what's the former Soviet Union, who discovered enormous amounts of oil and gas down in the crystalline basement, which is where the where what the Russians call the bio boobies would tell you it's impossible to find oil and gas. The what my article does, which would be understood unfortunately, physicists and chemists who know better than this biological silliness have sort of allowed themselves to be cowed into silence because when they were saying, no, no, oil doesn't come from squashed fish or putrefied cabbage because the laws of thermodynamics prohibit such evolution, they would then be confronted with, well, okay, you tell us where it does come from, blah, 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 and they couldn't say. Literally, the question, the problem of describing in proper physical terms exactly how oil does evolve was only solved recently. That's the second part of the paper which mm -hmm. you cited. Mm -hmm. so you, and, and the third part was a demonstration of that. Yeah, by making it in a laboratory. Exactly. We made it uh, in a laboratory. And, and let me see if I, can, if I can take a call in here. Uh, let's go to Paul in Kansas City, Missouri. Hi, Paul. How are you doing? Hi. Interesting topic. I've got a, a friend of mine who's a geologist who happens to stay with me uh, while he work at, works here in town uh, for a company. And I taught him years ago in chemistry, uh, just as an aside. Mm -hmm. uh, but my, my question here is, you're talking about uh, what calcium carbonate is being uh, feedstock for this process. Mm -hmm. And where does that calcium carbonate originally come from? What, what processes produce that in the, in the earth? I was under the assumption that it might, might be it uh, composed of seashells. Uh, Do you want me to answer that? Yeah. Right. Okay, first, when my colleagues, we, we argued about this as to whether to use as the source of carbon calcium carbonate, or whether we should use just pure graphite initially. I argued for graphite, because that is certainly going to be the more common form of elemental carbon at the depths of the mantle. However, they said that makes the problem too easy. We want to start with a real oxidized form of carbon, and as you know as a geologist, well, I'm sorry, sir, I didn't quite... Were you the chemist or with a friend of his a geologist, or are you the geologist? I'm, I'm the ex-chemist, and he's a okay. geologist. <laughs> okay, well, good enough. As your geologist friend will then affirm for you, calcium carbonate of mantle origin has been observed in these geological formations called carbonatites, where by use of other isotopic tests, they've ascertained that some of these carbonatite formations are indeed of mantle origin. So there is calcium carbonate in the form, CaCO3, in the mantle. Yeah, it's not non-biological or origin. No, no. Yeah. You can dispose of that right away. Okay. Because, remember, no biological molecule can exist at the temperature higher than the critical temperature of water. Right. Strictly the critical temperature of salt water. That's not much difference. And the critical temperature of salt water is reached at a depth of about three kilometers, five kilometers, depending on whether you have the, uh, you're in a continental environment or marine environment. So the notion that the uh, carbon material at the depths of the mantle might be biological of origin uh, really has no meaning. All right, all right, okay, Paul? Yes, yeah, good enough. What do, you, what, what do you think of this theory? As a... oh, it's interesting. I, I, uh, I've heard uh, similar things uh over the years, and and the idea of a Manhattan-style project, uh, I've been arguing that point myself with people about Good. the current energy crisis, that we need a, a project of that level. Uh, get that man's name, please, moderator. <laughs> I want to get back to him. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Paul, write him a letter. Read it in, in, in Nature, and you can you can reach Dr. Kenny in Nature there. Thanks okay. for calling. Excuse me. Um, I'd rather call you the Proceedings of the Academy of Sciences. Uh, I'm sorry, you're right. The point that okay, I'd like to make. Yeah, go ahead. There are over four thousand articles written in the mainstream Russian scientific press on this subject mm -hmm. and hundreds of books and many many monographs it's a scandal that n essentially not one of these has ever been published in been translated and published in say the Journal of Petroleum Geology or All right, we, so on and so forth uh, let, me, let me see if we can uh, get another call in here um, 
I think we have a uh, Russian geologist on uh, one of our lines here. Let's see if we can go to that one. Let's go to uh, Alan in Charlotte, North Carolina. Yes, hi, Ira. Yes. Thank you for taking my call. Yes. I'm actually not Russian, but I went to uh, school in the former Soviet Union, and I finished geology uh, in the mid-'80s. And I would like to ask, uh, is this new petroleum that has been artificially made um, – does it behave exactly the same under polarized light as the natural one? Because when we were in school, we had some artificial petroleum, and it did not behave. And I'm talking about optically. Mm -hmm. And uh, Why is that important? Because that's the way you, you can find out if it's uh, artificial or, a, or, or uh, natural and different uh, petroleum for, from different places. Mm -hmm. Uh, actually behaves a little bit different on the on the polarized light. Dr. Kenny? Yes. First, could I have the man's name again, please? Alan. And uh, he mentioned he actually studied in the Soviet Union. Would he be willing to say whose student he was? Dr. Kenny, I'm running out of time. <laughs> I want to answer the question I didn't get an answer. Okay. The answer, first, for the question, there's the confusion about optical activity. Optical activity is not a measure of any biological origin. That point's been known since the 70s. The origin of optical activity and why purely constructed abiotic fluids produce optical activity has been completely described in an article in the scientific journal Physical Chemistry, Chemical Physics, Year 2000, Volume 2, page 3163 authored by J.F. Kenney from the Russian mm -hmm. Academy of Sciences and Ulrich K. Deiters from the University of Cologne. I, 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 it's, I, it's a long subject. It was a, okay, well, let me move on. Has, the mistake is that optical activity is some evidence of a biological origin is completely incorrect. All right, let me move on. You made that point. Let me move on to, the, to ask why, if, uh, why if, it, if, if it has an origin that are not from biological origins, why do... Oil companies still successfully look for oil using that criteria. Okay. For, as a man who has lived or died as an oil company looking for oil, they don't successfully mm -hmm. look for it using that criteria. The measure of exploration success mm -hmm. by British and American petroleum companies in the absence of seismic data, which mm -hmm. is so good you can see the oil on the ground, right. if you don't have that, their rate of success is one commercial well out of 28 dry holes. As a study from the United States Geological Survey made clear about 15 years ago, the success rate of American petroleum companies is so poor that it is, quote, no better than random, unquote. Right. In other words, these oil companies, they do as well to get an eight-year-old child to throw darts on a map in the wall as to hire an American geologist to tell them where to drill. All right, let me uh, interrupt and remind everybody that I'm Ira Flato, and this is Talk of the Nation Science Friday from NPR News. Uh, yet you'd say you're having a difficult time convincing your colleagues, are you not? Excuse me, <laughs> I work with the Russian... Uh, I don't mean your Russian yeah, colleagues, I mean your American, your American colleagues or other... Uh, I don't really bother to try to persuade them. I'm in competition with them. Oh, in what way? I'm an oil and gas driller. Yeah. And I remind, there's one, a wonderful quotation here. I'll, I'll sort of sums it up. At the Na International Conference on Deep Drilling in 1992, the academician Nikolaevsky gave one of the invited talks on petroleum and pointed out, including taking examples from American oil and gas fields, of the evidence of mantle origin fluids in the crude oil. And when he was through speaking, this young fellow sort of leapt to his feet and in a voice redolent with aggressive hostility, asked, Professor Nikolaevsky, don't you know that oil comes from biological detritus in the sediments? Academician Nikolaevsky fixed him with a basilisk stare for a moment and said, that is nonsense. In mm. Russia, we have known for more than 40 years that petroleum is a juvenile material erupted from great depth. He paused for a minute, and while still fixing his eye on this young man, continued, and I remind you that Russia 
is the largest petroleum producing and exporting nation in the world. All right, let, let me get a quick question in before we have to go to Karen in, uh, in Oregon. Hi, Karen. Oh, hi. Um, thank you for taking my question. Um, you, I don't know if that's the same gentleman you're still speaking with, but um, originally he said that um, you should ask him, whoever you know was going to mm. spout off any kind of theory, how much oil and gas he had exactly discovered himself. Right. And I didn't hear that. Now I may have missed. Well, it let me ask that, Dr. Kenny, if your if if your if your ideas are right about where this is coming from, are you much more successful in this, as a driller in discovering oil. Well. This is a wonder. I love this question. Someone throws it back in my face. I even t try to say, well, don't you really mean i got about 20 seconds. Okay. During the past 10 years, working in collaboration with V.A. Kryushkin of the Academy of Sciences, we've brought in a series of oil and gas fields on the northern flank of the Dnieper Donets Basin, greater than the entirety of the reserves in Alaska. Wow. All right, you've got the last word. Well, yes, sir. Thank you very well, much. The Russians have the last word. Please get it right, sir. <laughs> All right. J.F. Kenny is CEO of the Gas Resources Corporation in Houston, Texas. Uh, we're going to take a short break. And we'll